And I'm honored to preach this morning. The pastor is out of town having some much needed family time and some time away. How many of you know the pastors need that? They do. And we've got a great pastor, and I'm so thankful for, for my pastor. And I know you are too. And, and uh, it's an honor to, to be here filling some big shoes, <laughs> literally. Uh, can't quite fill them in physically. I'm going to do my best uh, in, in the Word this morning. But uh, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this final day of the year, at the cusp of, of a brand new one? fills us with hope and expectation, hopefully. And I'm wanting to read this passage of Scripture to you out of Hebrews this morning. And we're going to pull some principles out of it and let it just speak to our hearts and our lives. And let's pick up Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. You can follow along on the screens as well. And it says this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. I'm going to key in on that phrase this morning. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that it speak deeply to us. God, let it challenge us. Let it comfort us. Let it speak to our hearts in in ways that it It needs to in each and every one of us, God, corporately and personally, God, this morning, Lord, we thank you for it. Pray that you just minister in, God, just a very special and divine way to each and every one of us this morning. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. You can be seated. I want to key in on that phrase, let us hold fast this morning. Originally, it's a nautical term stemming from the Dutch term old vast, meaning hold tight. Holding fast refers to being on board a vessel, a nautical vessel, and uh, a line that that is fast is firmly and positively secured. And, you know, being on a ship, especially in tumultuous seas and times of storm, it's really important that you secure your lines of rigging. Nowadays, that that term hold fast is referring to grit and bravery and and holding on. And let's face it, life life takes some grit. Most of us, save some of the little ones in the room, know that. We know that already. We've had that experience, those times when we've had to muster up the bravery to go on. The times that we've had to have some grit to get through a season that we're in. And it's in those moments that what we're holding fast to matters. The older I've gotten, I appreciate the new year, and and I appreciate the reflection that comes with the closing of of the old year, but but some of it feels like the slow click up the roller coaster. You know what's what's coming, and you're preparing yourself for the white-knuckled ride ahead. It's like, hang on, here we go. Does anybody identify with that? You have the holiday season where everything's sweet and special and it kind of slows down. And then as you approach the new year, you're like, oh, here we go. We're starting again. And when it comes to the beginning of the new year, it's important that we all approach it firmly and positively secured in our faith, holding fast. You may, you may make resolutions. Maybe you don't. Maybe you've given up on those a long time ago. But whatever the case you need to make at least one resolution this year, and that's to hold fast in your faith. Because like a roller coaster, life is full of ups and downs and maybe like a, a tumultuous, stormy sea, the waves swell. You have to be anchored in Christ, especially when those storms and waves hit. So let's look at some principles that we can pull out of this verse in Hebrews this morning. First thing I want to bring out is that we need to hold fast with the truth. We have to hold fast with the truth. 
If you start anywhere in 2018, you got to start with Jesus. I'm going to say that again. If you start anywhere, start with Jesus, our foundation. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. If you make any resolutions, make one at least that you're going to know Jesus more. That's a good resolution. I know we want to try the latest fad diet and try to see how long we can survive on grapefruit and water. And we want to set unrealistic expectations and try to do this, that, and the other. And in a couple weeks into the new year, we're disappointed in ourselves because we break all of those res- resolutions, whatever. You go ahead and try those, but at least make one resolution this year, and that's I'm going to know Jesus more. Because that's one that matters. That's one that has eternal implications. That's one that you can be anchored in that's going to cause your faith to rise. That one resolution, know Jesus more. I want to read Colossians 1, 15 through 23 this morning. And it's known as being one of the richest Christological passages in Scripture. And the author of Colossians uses this Christ-centered doctrine that he displays in this passage to set up the instructions that he gives later in this Christ-centered living. The first chapter refers to being filled with knowledge, that right belief, and then walking worthy, which is this right action. And and isn't that how it should be? That our Christ-centered belief should produce Christ-centered living? And if anything, we need to start there, the beginning of this new year, the firm resolve to live centered on Christ. And I want to read you this, and you can follow along on the screen, but here's some truth. If you're going to start with truth, here's some truth, the truth of Jesus. The heading of this passage is the supremacy of the Son of God, and it says this in verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, if you hold fast, Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. We could pack it up and go now. Because that just preached. It preached Jesus. It preached Jesus reigning supreme. It preached the Son of God high and lifted up. It preached Jesus that died for you, that died for me. We celebrated his birth this Christmas season. But that baby would crow, walk the earth, preaching a revolutionary good news, fully God, fully man. And he was crucified, buried in the grave, raised three days later, resurrected, ascending to the right hand of the Father, and that Jesus is coming again. And guess what? It gets better because if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give to you your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He'll give us life. And it gets even better because if you look at Colossians and you find out about Jesus, then you got to go to Romans and find out more and the implications of that. It says in verse 8 in Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, as many who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And it gets better. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And we know in verse 28 that all things work together for the good 
of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. In verse 31, what are we going to say to all this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then he caps it off with this in verse 37, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, whatever happened this year, what's going to happen this next year, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus. Jesus. The truth of Jesus, the one that reigns supreme. You can't walk away from a gift like that. We can't walk away from that. This past Christmas season, we celebrated this gift of Jesus, this child born in Bethlehem. And now it's time to open that gift and put it to use. Emmanuel, God with us. And in him, we have everything we need to live this life full of faith. My kids opened some presents this Christmas, and since then, they've been putting those gifts to use. They've been playing with them and working them and enjoying them. This year, work the gift you've got in Christ. Enjoy the gift you have in Christ. Stay grounded in the gift of life that Christ has given you, the grace, the forgiveness, the the relationship that's been opened up that you can have with him, the spirit empowerment, the overcoming power. Hold fast and be anchored in it. Hold fast to the truth that Jesus reigns. Get a grip on that truth before the bills come in, before the big decisions you have to make in 2018. Before the work grind hits again, before the semester starts back, before any of that stuff, hold fast to that truth. Heading back to Hebrews in that passage, we can hold fast to truth, and because of that truth, we can be bold and we can draw near. In verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. That scripture says that we can boldly enter into the most holy place. We've been given access. You have been given access. And not only have we been given access, but we've been invited into close relationship. And you know what that close relationship should cause us to live with? Confidence. What if... What if you started this year with a renewed sense of confidence? Not not in yourself, not in your bank account, not with what you can do with your own two hands, not anything like that, but this renewed sense of confidence in God. Fresh and new, resolute, standing on the truth. And not only can you be made new, not only can you be bold and draw near, but you can be made new. In verse 22, it says this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because of Jesus, we can be made new from the inside out. Heart, mind, our way of living, all of it. This truth should cause us to live with hearts full of faith. It should cause us to think differently. It should spill out into the life that we live. Start 2018 from a place of truth and allow that truth to be what helps you get a grip and hold fast in this life. The amazing thing is Jesus has extended a divine lifeline to us. Let's hold fast to it. So not only should we hold fast with truth, but but two, secondly, we should hold fast with our declaration. Verse 23 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Realize this, what you declare matters. What have you been declaring over your life lately? What have you been saying? What have you been confessing? What have you been declaring? Have you been declaring things based on your confession of hope? Have you been declaring things based on your confession of hope that you have in Jesus? Or have you been declaring things based on your perceived inadequacy? Or declarations based in frustration? or anxiety. Know this, what you declare will either either propel you into the abundant life that's available to you in Jesus, or it will put up fences of limitation. 
I'm going to say that again. What you declare will either propel you into the abundant life that you have available to you in Jesus, or it's going to put up fences of limitation. We see in Proverbs that the tongue has the power of life and death, and we need to learn all the more to speak with purpose. Your spiritual life and strength are accelerated through what you declare, so speak truth. If you're going to hold fast, hold fast with the truth, and then declare the truth. Hold fast through your declarations. Speak the word. What if, what if this year, because you're holding fast with the truth, you begin to declare that truth in your life on a daily basis? You know, here's something interesting to think about. As the people of God were about to cross over into the promised land, they were instructed to speak first and act second. Their actions flowed out of what they spoke. This is what it says in Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. They were told to implement nonstop declaring of truth as they prepared to step into their promise. Speak first. What are you speaking over this year already? Because it matters. Are you speaking from a place of dread? Are you speaking from a place of hope? Are you speaking from a place of I'm hoping I can make it? Are you speaking from a place of Christ reigns supreme over all already? And he is victorious. What are you declaring? What if you implemented a continual declaration of truth in your life this year? It would change your life. That's what it would do. It would change your life. What if you declared things like this? I am steadfast of mind. He keeps me in perfect peace because I trust in him, based in Isaiah 26. Or you say and declare over your day, the joy of the Lord is my strength, like it says in Nehemiah 8. Or you base it in Philippians 1 when you say, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or what if you base it in Psalms 107, as I speak God's word, he sends it to heal and to deliver me from my destruction. Or what if you declare this, that God forgives all my iniquities and heals me of all my diseases, like it's based in Psalm 103. And what if you say this, based in Psalm 103 again, God redeems my life from the pit. He crowns me with loving kindness and compassion. What if you begin saying these things over your day, letting out a declaration based in scripture, based in truth. God satisfies my mouth with good things and renews my youth like the eagles. Christ bore my sins in his own body on the cross and I am healed by his stripes. Begin to declare the truth. It's going to help you hold fast. Because when you feel like you're slipping and your grip is running out, it's going to help you hold fast. Your declaration is like taking a hold of a rope that you're holding fast to, but that declaration is like the pine tar that you put on your hands first. Declaration matters. Life would change as you declare because you're declaring the truth of the word, and the more truth that's in you, the less room there is for deception. And because you begin speaking the truth of the word instead of the lies that we tend to tell ourselves, we begin to be full of faith. And when we're full of faith, it begins to affect our thinking. And when our thinking is affected, it begins to flow into our actions. And as our thinking affects our actions, it affects our lifestyle and creates healthy habits. It'll change our life. Instead of grasping at other things like wealth and affirmation and man-made remedies and all these other things, hold fast to the confession of hope that you have in Christ Jesus and declare truth. Not only should we hold fast with truth and and declaration, but we should hold fast by confessing our weaknesses and relying on God's strength. Verse 23 in that Hebrews 10 passage says this, without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Life has a way of knocking the faith out of you at times. Amen? Amen. That's not unchristian to say. We've all had hard times. We've experienced that, and sometimes it can cause your faith to waver. You can feel like you're about to lose it, like you're just hanging on, that your grip is slipping. You see, when our, our hands are full of our worries, 
and our fears and our doubts, our troubles, our frustrations, when our hands are full of those, it's hard to keep a grip on the lifeline that's going to pull you through. It's hard to hold fast when your hands are full of all your cares and concerns. But we have this awesome invitation in scripture to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We read earlier about Jesus, the one who reigns supreme and is holding all things together. That Jesus cares for us, the one that's over all, the one that's holding all this together. That Jesus cares for us and he is faithful. We could go all across this room and hear story after story after story of God's faithfulness, of his healing, his provision, his restoration, his grace, his mercy, his direction. He's faithful. And the big thing is, is you can trust that faithful God, especially in your weak moments. It says in 2 Corinthians 12, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When you feel like you're losing your grip, hold fast by confessing your weakness to this strong, faithful, capable God that we have. Philippians 4, 6 reminds us of this, that, that we don't have to worry. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you feel like your faith is wavering this year, confess it. Take it to him. You've already been given access through Jesus. Now allow that confession to open the door for strength that God wants to pour in your life. Let that bring you peace and let that peace help you continue to hold fast. Finally, we're not only to hold fast with truth and declaration, not only to hold fast with relying on God's strength and our weakness, but we should also hold fast with the help of community. Verse 24, that Hebrews 10 passage says this, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Can I tell you this? That one of the greatest strengths we have, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us is each other. We have a great church. We have a great church. There are great people here at this church. We're blessed, Westmore. I hope you realize that. I hope you know it. I've met some of the best people I've ever known in my entire life at this church. We're blessed. And it would be an anchor point for each and every one of us to maximize the relationships in the community that's available if we open ourselves up and grow in faith together. And the imagery here is this stirring up of love and good works, it's the image of stoking a fire, stirring the embers, keeping the flame going. How about we stir up the family room this year with love and encouragement? This bond of love that we have. Because when we do, we're helping each other hold fast. Every time you walk into this room, we don't know exactly who's going through what who's experiencing a hard time, what kind of week somebody just came out of, what they're dealing with personally that nobody knows. But when we stir up these good works, these these moments of love and encouragement, man, it means something. Your smile, your hug, your good word, what you have to offer when you walk into this place could be exactly what somebody needs to hold fast. God could use you in an incredible way to help somebody else. If you do anything in 2018, I know we talked about this resolution of starting with Jesus, but go to church. Be here. Get involved. Get plugged in. 
Get the truth in you through the community Bible reading. Get plugged into a small group. Intentionally maximize the relationships that are available. Growing together. I love this verse in Ecclesiastes 4.12. It says this, that the one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a, but a three-strand cord is not quickly broken. It's an imagery there of a rope, a lifeline. That rope that we hold fast to. These three strands woven together. There's you, there's me, there's Jesus. There's Jesus. Because you see where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So there's this divine intertwining. There's us, but there's also this divine strand running through it. There's you and there's me in community, but there's also something divine going on in the middle of it. There's Jesus holding us together, and because of him, we can hold fast. Because you see, when I, when I lose my grip, when I lose my grip and it's bound to happen in 2018 because life happens, but when I lose my grip, there's you plus Jesus. And it's gonna help me hold fast. And likewise, when you lose your grip in 2018 because things happen, because life happens, guess what? There's me plus Jesus. And it's gonna help you hold fast. And Jesus holds it all together. What if you made 2018 the year that you maximized godly relationships in your life? And you quit doing it all on your own. And you quit living like an island. And you took all these things and you said, you know what? I'm going to anchor myself in truth. I'm going to hold fast with truth. And I'm going to declare it. Not only am I going to declare it, but God, I'm going to be open and willing and vulnerable. I'm not going to try to do it myself with my own frail two hands, but I'm going to release it to you because your strength, your grace, it's enough. But God, now I'm not going to stop there, but I'm going to be open enough to allow myself to be relationally connected with believers you will find a depth of strength like you've never known. Because there's this lifeline that's going to be supporting you. You know, tonight, you're probably going to celebrate. Unless you're one of those people that says, I got to work in the morning, I'm going to bed. But for the majority of us, we're going to celebrate watch the clock close out 2017 and ring in 2018. And my hope for you is that when you finally crawl into bed in the waking minutes of a brand new year, that the thought on your mind as your head hits the pillow is this, God's got this. God's got me. God's got my family. God's got my job situation. That when your head hits the pillow, it's not filled with uneasiness or anxiety and worry and all this stuff, but it's filled with the truth. But God's got this. I love this. My, my wife, as she's laying the, the kids in bed, and you know, we've, we've gone through a little season where they've just kind of you know, kids just kind of get, get fear kind of wells up in them and they have some moments where they're just kind of afraid and I've just seen my wife help them declare truth and relationally hold them, help them hold fast. And she'll look at them and just say, hey, repeat after me. God, I love you and I know you love me. And they'll say it again. God, I love you and I know you love me. God, I love you, and I know you love me. Truth, declaration, and moments of weakness, go ahead and confess it and lean on his strength and rely on the strength of community. Let's do that 
in 2018. Let's stand this morning together.